again and again when we're facing hardships or danger. We're told to re recollect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And there are many reasons for this. One of the reasons is that the Buddha and the Noble Sangha were free of passion, free of aversion, free of delusion. And for that reason, they're free of fear. And we should take heart in that. That they have faced dangers, and they were able to come out, at the very least, with their goodness intact. And we should follow their example. Another reason is, as in that passage we chanted just now, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are limitless. There is a limit to creeping things, other dangerous. So our immediate reaction to dangers should be not to follow our instincts to get angry or fearful, but to think of the larger principle of maintaining the good, good state of our minds. And we got good advice from the Buddha on how to do that. There's a passage where Sariputta talks about recollecting the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And it's interesting for several reasons. When he says if you're being attacked, you should remember the Buddha's teaching on what to do when you're attacked. He said even if bandits were sawing off your limbs with a two-handed saw, you should not have ill will for them. Even for them, you should have goodwill. And so you should make a resolve. I'm going to follow the Buddhist teachings. And he says you try to develop what he calls skillful equanimity. Notice he places a condition on it. It has to be skillful. Not all equanimity is skillful. Indifference is not skillful. Or just giving up is not skillful, saying, well, I'll just have to accept whatever. Even if you have to submit physically to danger, you have to work on your mind. And as the Buddha says elsewhere, if there are ways that you can escape the danger, go for them. But you do it in a way that's skillful. But if you find that it's largely a matter of training your mind, Sariputta talks about four qualities you try to develop your mindfulness. Keep it relentless. In other words, keep in mind the Buddhist teachings on how to deal with hardships. And secondly, try to make your concentration well established. Third, develop tranquility. And fourth, put forth effort. It's interesting that tranquility and effort go together there, but sometimes it requires a lot of effort to remain tranquil in the midst of dangerous situations. So mindfulness, concentration, tranquility, effort. This is how you create a skillful state of equanimity. Remember, this is the equanimity of a warrior who faces the fact that, yes, there are going to be setbacks, but you don't let your mind get knocked out of alignment because of them. You remember your primary duty is to maintain the state of your mind, because even if you have to die, the state of the mind is what you've got. The one thing you've got now, if you let the state of mind get ruined by how you die, then you've lost everything. You've lost your body and you've lost your mind. So you have to remember what's important here. Keep your priorities straight. Then Sariputta goes on to say that even if you can't develop that kind of skillful equanimity, then you should have a reaction of apprehension and sangwega. Now remember, sangwega sometimes means dismay, and sometimes it means terror. In a case like this, where you're facing danger, the fact that you cannot maintain your mind, that's really serious. This is a way of motivating even more effort 
to develop that skillful state of equanimity. So notice you regard defeat as the real danger, defeat of the state of your mind. And you will do everything you can in order to avoid that. You see it as a real danger. That's where the real danger in death is, is if the state of the mind gets destroyed. So what all this points to is the importance of your mind, and how you should be willing to make other sacrifices for the state of, sake of maintaining the state of your mind. Because this is your true belonging. So this, the sorry Buddha says, is what it means to recollect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It's interesting in the course of that, he does mention the fact that the Buddha taught the simile of the Sangha. He doesn't mention the word Dhamma or Sangha at all, but it's implicit. Both of them are implicit. One in the fact is that what the Buddha taught is, is of course, the Dhamma. And there's one point where he says, this is how the Buddha's bidding is done. In other words, this is the example that's been set by members of the Noble, noble Sangha before us. There's a passage in the Theragata where a monk is off in the wilderness and he's come down with disease. The question is, is he going to go looking for a doctor? And then he remembers the Noble Sangha, the example of the Noble Sangha before him. So I'm going to try to develop the factors for awakening, to try to develop the five strengths, and use that to fight off the disease. Now there are cases in the canon where people are recollecting the seven factors of awakening. Mahogulana, Mahagasava, even the Buddha himself, do recover from their illness because of recollecting these things. But if the illness doesn't go away, you at least got your mind with a good topic. You've furnished it well. This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha talks about the factors that lead to a good rebirth, i.e. a rebirth in the heavenly realms. Learning is one of, one of the factors. Having learned the Dharma and learning how to keep that in mind. This is one of the reasons why the Forest of Johns emphasize learning how to chant when you go out into the wilderness. Having a fund of chants so that your mind has something good to stay with. When it suddenly hits you that there are dangers all around, protection is far away. What have you got? You've got your chance as your friends. And of course the devas like to hear these things. So you protect yourself with thoughts of the Buddha, thoughts of the Dhamma, thoughts of the Sangha. So don't forget and just go to your old instincts when you react to danger. And we chat about taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha every day. And it becomes more and more of a ceremony. But you have to remember that when the Forest of Johns went out into the, into the forest, into the wilderness, they really were putting their lives on the line. And the idea of taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha took on extra meaning. Realizing that their survival of the good state of their minds, that was the important point. That's what makes the Buddha, and the Dharma, and the Sangha unlimited. Because the dangers that face your body are limited only to the survival of the body. When the body dies, that's it. As far as those dangers are concerned, they're not dangers anymore. But the mind doesn't die with the death of the body. So it goes beyond whatever those dangers were, as long as you don't focus on the dangers and make a big issue out of them and let the state of your mind fall. So recollecting the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha is basically taking on a fighter's attitude, the attitude of a warrior. And a warrior wants to come out winning. It has a very clear sense of what victory means. 
Remember the principle in the Dhammapada. Victory over a thousand others is nothing compared to victory over yourself. Because victory over others can turn into defeat. But when you've gained victory over your defilements, that's a victory that lasts.